I'm so happy to be on stage talking about a topic I never would have expected to be talking about today with Manil Suri, a novelist and mathematician. Um, when Manil emailed me this summer suggesting we do this panel together, I said to him, Manil, I know absolutely nothing about math. Absolutely nothing. But he has assured me this is actually my number one qualification. So Manil, make good on that promise, please. Yeah. Uh the reason I said that is because um, you know I'm trying to reach out to people who, who are not mathematicians. So the fact, if, you, if they had paired me with a mathematician, uh, we would have discussed, I don't know, Fermat's last theorem and forgotten about the rest of you and that would have been it. So uh, that's the kind of attitude that I'm trying to get beyond. Um, and uh, so, so you're perfect because you actually are, you're a representation, hopefully, of many people in the audience. So think of it that way. And uh, I think the crux of the matter is that math is something that's very misunderstood. It's uh, much hated. I think mathematicians are probably the most hated after dentists or something. Um, <laughs> uh, and you know, I've been at several parties and people say, what do you do? I, I'm a mathematician. And very nice for you. And then they walk off to get a drink. So, uh, and, and of course that's changed since I've done the novel stuff. But uh, I just thought that it's really important, given how important uh, math is for day-to-day -day, um, being able to do stuff in our society, being called upon to really think about you know, high power things like climate change and economy and so on, you need to have some sort of mathematical sense. Mm -hmm. Now that part is one aspect of math. The aspect that I'm really interested in is getting people interested in it getting people to appreciate math, mm -hmm. unlocking some of the joys that math can give, even if you don't have a background in mathematics. So that's my kind of you know, uh, strange thesis that you don't really need to know calculus or anything else mm -hmm. like that to be able to appreciate math. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of track that I'm gonna try and give you some examples and we'll discuss some things, we'll even uh, be showing you a little bit of a play that, that I wrote and I've been acting. And uh, just, just really different things, like out of the box thinking, how can we make mathematics something that's enjoyable by mm -hmm. large amounts of people? And, and just, just one other thing I'll add, uh, think about it. If you're not a professional artist, you can go to a museum and you can actually see art and you can really have that need satisfied. If you're not a mathematician or a scientist or something, where do you go to actually exercise that muscle uh, about you know, that, that the one that actually uh, is innate in all of us? And this is, this is something that has been proven through research, that even babies, they can tell the difference between numbers when they are just out of, just in their cribs. So there is a mathematical part of our brains that needs to be exercised or that needs to see mathematical beauty. And the question is, how do we actually do that? And of course, you write about this all so beautifully in the New York Times. Um, I wonder if you, you would tell us about some of the ideas you've explored in, in your column there. Sure, yeah. The, I think the first one I wrote was uh, about appreciating math, you know, just what I've said. And I gave a few examples in there, um, trying to tell people that, again, you don't really need to know, you know, you don't need to know calculation. Uh, a lot of us are bad at calculation. I am actually bad at calculation. Um, when I go to a restaurant and people say, okay, it's time to divide the check, give it to the mathematician, uh, <laughs> I always tell them I'm a mathematician, not a calculator. You know, I'm bad at calculation. I don't do long division very well. So, so that's one thing that we have to go beyond. Okay, we don't need to be good calculators. Um, I, I'll just tell you one example from the New York Times in this one article. It was about, uh, you know, let's say you have a square with four equal sides and then you draw a pentagon with five equal sides. And then you draw a hexagon, which has six equal sides. And you keep doing that, you get to an octagon, you get to you know, something with 10 sides, with 12 sides, with 100 sides. What do you think is happening? Where is this going? You're getting a circle. Now that's actually a very deep concept, that, but, but which is something that we all can immediately relate to that if you take polygons with more and more sides, you get a circle. This is something that mathematicians actually make precise and very formal in terms of limits and calculus. You know, this is the basis of calculus. 
And what we say is that the limit of the polygon is a circle. And you can treat it very, in terms of formulas and so on and so forth, you can prove it. But you can also, I can see someone in a yoga class asking you, okay, this is a form of meditation, think about a circle being generated as the limit of the polygons. And notice that the polygons never actually become a circle. That's, a, that's something that's, you know, that's, that's where the infinite lies. When you have an infinite number of sides, then all the angles disappear and you suddenly have this smooth circle. So it's, it's things like that that, you know, make us, at least it made me, when I heard that, I said, wow, that's, that's neat. That is neat. I'm, I'm so curious about the process at the Times. How, does, how do your New York Times editors sort of restrain or restrict you, or what guidelines do they give you for how mathematical to get for a general audience? Yeah, that's, that's, that's always the issue. Like, okay, you know, when is, when is it too much? When have I gone off the deep end and started <laughs> putting formulas in there? Um, one thing nice about the New York Times is they can't even generate the number pi. I mean, they can't do any typography in their articles because they say, oh, no, 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 our, our typesetter will, will throw a fit. So take that out, write it as, a, as PI. Uh, so, so, you know, that's a real uh, limit. But, but beyond that, I think it's really good to have uh, people like them who are really not mathematicians filter things and censor things and say, okay, you can go this far, but not too far. And one of the, one of the things that I wrote about was uh, about crabs, crab populations in the Chesapeake, how mathematics is actually helping people figure out what the crab populations will be year to year. And I started it with some, uh, with just a little bit about, you know, like exponential growth and things like that. And um, they actually liked the article, but there was a big discussion. Should we cut that out? And should we write it all in terms of non-math stuff that people can relate to better? Or should we actually allow him to put just these traces, hints of math? And finally, my editor actually won out uh, because, because at some point I was saying, well, can we just put this word? And she said, look, I've already done a big fight for you, so just, just let me take this one word out because <laughs> it'll, it'll be something that you know, people won't like. So. Uh -huh. Pick your battles. Yes, exactly. Um, and, but of course, sometimes your, your columns in the Times have, have provoked some, some blowback from the math community. Yeah, the, the worst one was, uh, th this year, incidentally, was uh, the, the, the 14th of March of this year was this once-in-a-lifetime Pi Day, P-I. Because if you look at 3, 1, 4, 3.14, that's the first three digits of Pi. And then if you look at 1, 5 after that, which is the year that we're in, that's the next two digits in the expansion of pi. So I wrote this article on looking at, you know, this once in a lifetime pi day. And I wrote all these weird things which happen with pi, you know, just, if you read it, you'll see that they're, they're really kind of far out, but written in language that everyone could understand. And I was quite pleased with it. And then when I saw the article, I almost said, oh my God, you know what they had put on top of the article? Don't expect math to make any sense. And, you know, I started getting these emails from mathematicians that I knew saying, how dare you write an article and say that, you know, what are people going to think and so on. Uh, some of the comments on the Times, they were saying things like, Mr. Suri, math makes perfect sense. You should go back to your textbooks. What kind of teacher are you? Blah, blah, blah. So it was really like horrifying. And I finally said, why did you do this? Why are you, why did you put this horrible title on it? And their explanation was very good. They said that we're really trying to get to those people who have had problems with math, who might not like math. And if you put something that's, you know, really promoting that, they might just not click on it. But with a provocative title like that, they will click on it. And sure enough, it reached the number one um, article for that, for that week or that day or something. It was the most emailed article. And I think it would have been number one for the week, mm -hmm. but the Pope said something and everyone said it, you know, <laughs> looking at his article, so. Um, but don't you find there is sort of a price to pay as a, ser as a serious mathematician or s someone who, a scientist, there is a price to pay for wanting to have popular appeal. Yeah, you know, that's something I suspect happens not just in math, but uh, in other fields too. Uh, and maybe most in academia where, uh, you're often asked to just specialize in one thing. Like if you're, if you're a writer, you know, you should just bury your nose in the writing and know everything about other authors and so on and just do that. 
It's much more in mathematics. And uh, I think the, the one example that really strikes me, stays with me, is I was uh, a new professor at my university, and there was a very famous mathematician, Ivar Stockgold, who's also a very famous bridge player. He came and gave a talk on differential equations, and uh, afterwards a senior statistician in my university took me aside and said, that talk was terrible. And I said, how do you know? You're, it, it's, it's mathematics and you're a statistician. He said, oh, he spends too much time playing bridge, so he can't possibly be good. <laughs> and so then I knew that, okay, uh, if I'm gonna be writing, I'm gonna keep that secret because I wanted tenure. And so it was very interesting, all my novels and all, I did it completely in secret. Like once in a while I'd go in the summer and tell them, uh, I'm, you know, I need to go away to write. And they said, what are you writing? And I said, uh, I'm writing a calculus textbook. Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> and then I would come back and they would say, can we have a look at what you wrote? And I said, it didn't go very well. I'll have to go again next summer. <laughs> so, so they didn't know until the book came out. Uh, so, and what, what was the reaction? All the people, all the junior professors who didn't have tenure yet, uh, they went out and bought my book because they wanted to make sure that I was happy uh, with them. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. Uh, but, but, you know, it was, it, was, it was, okay, so the reaction has been, there are a few people who are interested. Most, most people in my department just don't, you know, don't react to that. They just don't, they just treat me um, as, like a mathematician, which is perfect. That is what I want to be there. So they just don't look at that side of my life, which is good in terms of day-to-day -day, uh, kind of interaction. But when it comes to this idea of really propagating math, then that is an issue that they don't really, they're kind of blind to. And, you know, it is, it is completely different. So, so it's not something that, it's, it's something that gets some attention from a few people, but it's not high on people's list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So last night, another mathematician turned writer at this festival said to me, you know, the okay. thing... Let, let, let me, before we get to that, I forgot I was going to show a few things. And one of the things I wanted to show was this. There's a little... So, so one of the other things I've been doing is uh, doing little animations for mathematics. And I'm going to show you a little piece that was actually incorporated in this uh, Pi Day article. And uh, it's somewhere, it's something that I'm trying to combine the narrative and the mathematics. So it actually is a story, sort of. So let's see if I can pull this up. So this was, this was the issue that we were trying right before, but hopefully it'll work out. And if it's too loud, we'll have to... Uh, So incidentally, I should just point out that uh, this talks about fractions that are called rational numbers, and pi is an example of an irrational number. It cannot be listed as a fraction. So that's the number pi, which uh, the New York Times couldn't actually publish.
this is another property of fractions, that when you write them as a decimal, you'll always get a repeating decimal. It's hard to see it, but it's the same pattern. This is the way that... If you go far enough, it will repeat. I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but that's the decimal expansion of pi and it doesn't repeat. Okay, so you can, I know, I, I, it's a tragedy, so, well, <laughs> bittersweet love story. But yeah, let's, let's go back to our. Or should we just go into the, um, the other wonderful creation that, that you oh, made the, from math? The play? Shall we? Yeah, I think we should, probably. Right. So, um, and you were. In este video vamos a realizar. Oops, I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, so um, I think one of the things that, uh, so let, let me just set this up. So um, about a few years ago, I taught a class with a um, math, with a English professor at my university. And it was on math and literature. And it was a course that the incoming humanities scholars had to take. These were freshmen our first year students, and they didn't know, and most of them hated math, so suddenly we told them, hey, this is a class on mathematics and literature. So they were not too pleased, but uh, we, we, we incorporated various things into that, you know, we, uh, after the course, we wrote some essays on that, and then we were invited to give a talk in a university in Canada to, about this. Now my, my co-writer, my co-teacher, uh, was also, is also the dramaturg and an actress. She's the dramaturg at the Folger Theater in, uh, in Washington. So it occurred to us, why don't we try something really different and write a play about this? And then instead of giving a talk, when we go to uh, Toronto, we'll actually enact this, we'll do a reading of this play. And we didn't tell them in case the play didn't come about. So when we went there, we actually said, Right about a week before we said, hey, we need two other actors because we are going to play two parts and we need two student actors. So they got them and we went there, we did the reading and it worked out really well. And since then we've actually um, produced the play in a more formal way with a director and with a proper cast and we are still playing the two roles. And we've actually traveled to several cities and it's going to be produced in Delhi in January and in Pittsburgh next year. So it's really, you know, people have been reacting very well to it. Um, so the idea of this play is mathematics and literature, or mathematics and the humanities. Uh, the setup is, we, we fictionalized everything, of course, but the setup is that uh, the, these two professors at this university are forced to co-teach a class together on mathematics and literature. And uh, the university says, otherwise you lose your tenure. So uh, the first 
the first uh, section, the first uh, chapter, the first scene just sets it up. And this guy turns out to be, you know, the usual mathematician who's not looking at anything else. And Naomi Kessler, the, the woman, is a literature professor, and she's kind of a little, uh, she's never really understood math that well, so she's insecure about that a little. And so uh, we are actually going to enact out the second scene. Uh, one of the references that comes up in the first scene is that uh, the math professor, Pearson, actually also writes mathematical tales for children, uh, which has not gone anywhere, incidentally. So, so let's, let's just enact this out. So let's see how this works. It's a little hard with these mics, but... Yeah, it's up to you. If you want to, or you can, or you can just... I'll follow the, the okay. prearranged we were, stage directions. We actually spent about two hours this morning uh, <laughs> trying to practice this. But, you know, live theater, we didn't figure on these, so let's see. <laughs> So, the mathematics of being human. What do you think? For the course title, like it? I do. I like it. But what does it mean exactly? Oh, I thought, you know, math, mathematics, and human, the humanities, their intersection. Which you understand to be? You hate the title, don't you? I can tell. We can change it. The title's good, Mike. It's what we're going to teach that I don't get. Oh, oh, I was coming to that. It's quite amazing how it fits in. This paper I've been reading, how the differential equations used to track epidemics can be reformulated to spread the model of, to model the spread of ideas. Quite thrilling. Surely that's humanities-ish, right? The spread of ideas, like a disease? Differential equations. Oh, they're only first order. Oh yeah, I assume that. Um, you do realize that this seminar has been given a humanities listing, yes? It's a HUM course for freshmen who've received scholarships in the humanities. Yes, yes, I saw that, but some of them would have had calculus already, right? Maybe, but not all. We may need to brush up a few things, of course. A little time on limits and then just a smidgen on derivatives. A week. I bet I could have the class up to speed in a week. Whoa, time out. Again, this isn't a math course. The purpose is to connect mathematical ideas to humanities subjects. We need to discuss things. But if you don't know the math, how can you possibly try to discuss things anything? Things that, that have a mathematical, I don't know, something to them. Uh, I thought Alice in Wonderland to start. Oh, no, not that chestnut. Why not? Lewis Carroll was a mathematician. Just because the stories by a mathematician, people turn themselves inside out to see all sorts of mathematical effects in it. There's books written about the math in Alice. True, but you really would need to know higher math to appreciate what he's saying. Not something the kids would understand, nor you, I'm guessing. Nice. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, really. But we can't do Alice. I've never actually liked that little brat anyway. And I've thought about children's books and math. Remember I told you I write? Hey, maybe we can use my stories and use them in the class so that we can see how that goes. Okay, or I think you're right, actually. Children's literature may set the wrong tone. I guess there could be better choices. Fine. I see you've thought of your list. I've thought of mine. Let's just fire away. I thought that's what I was doing. Well, do better. We'll do, and it's your turn. Well, surely you must have come across my top choice in the library a book that relates the history of math but frames it in terms of the solution of the most famous mathematical theorem that's ever existed. You might have known, heard the name Fermat, who wrote in the margin of his notebook that... Title, please. Oh, okay. Fermat's Enigma by Simon Singh. They call it Fermat's Last Theorem in Britain. Didn't read it. But a book with theorem in the title? You can't just honk for him out away. I'm avenging Alice. And now, something you'll wish you thought of first. Gödel, Escherbach. Two dance. Oh, please, you're just bitter about Fermat. Would take ages to understand all the math. I read it as an under... <gasps> I did. You've been honked, Naomi. My turn. <laughs> Logic Comics, an epic search for truth. The comic book? That one I saw. All those miserable logicians who go nuts? Depressing. Wait, wait, let me try again. Flatland. At least, all right, knock it off. A beautiful, uh, 
At least let me finish the. From Euclid to. Goodwill. Hunt. Okay, stop. I have a play that's perfect. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Arcadia by Tom. Oh, no, really, this is. I'm going to take that away from you in a minute. The curious incident in the dog in the nighttime. Did you hear me? I said the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. I heard you. But you didn't honk. The book by Haddon about the boy with Asperger's who deals with the world through math. It's on my list too. You mean we actually have a text? We do. Hooray, we did it. We have a text. We did, but that's only the first. We need at least half a dozen more for a humanities seminar. Brace yourself. I want to do King Lear. Ah, Shakespeare. Why don't I take another look at Alice? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so, good, just enough time to ask Manil. Um, has your mathematical process helped you in the writing of your novels? Oh, well, uh, I actually have a PowerPoint for that. So, let's see if I can <laughs> you know uh, bring that up. Although, I don't think the sound is going to work on this, but let's see. So, this is, uh, this is a nice example uh, where I, this is my last, my most recent novel, The City of Davy. And, um, what I did in this novel was, I had all these ingredients, it's about a futuristic India, and there are three characters, and there's all sorts of different things going on. There's elephants, and pomegranates, and God knows what else. And you know, I, I was writing this book, and I kept getting all these ingredients, and I wasn't able to tie them together. And the months passed by, the years passed by, I couldn't do it. And so I said, okay, let me think about this as a mathematician. And I started writing down all the possible plot points, and I said, I'm gonna actually make a decision tree, which is something that if you've seen chess or something, you've seen, you know, white makes this move, then for this move of white, black can make these three moves, and then you go through this, and you write all possible ways that the game can evolve. Well, I started doing the same thing with, with my possibilities of plots. And what happened is, I went through this, you know, and nothing seemed to work. Either these plot things were too trite, or they were inconsistent, or they were something I'd seen before. And so I thought, okay, you know, this is amazing because I have actually come up with a mathematical proof that this novel cannot be written. <laughs> and I was really pleased. I said, both as a mathematician and as a writer, I have fulfilled my duty, and I'm done. And of course, my agent, uh, you know, I said, okay, I'm just, I told my agent, I'm gonna stop this, I'm gonna throw this book away, and I'm gonna start something new. And uh, she, she wasn't a mathematician, she, she, she didn't appreciate my proof. Uh, so she said, why don't you send it to me, and I'll take a look at it. And then, as I was looking at it, these three characters, they started making, So that was the big special effects. Uh, you know, I had three characters, and if any of you know my work, I've been writing this trilogy about Shiva, Vishnu, and the mother goddess Devi. And these three characters actually fit those patterns. And once I started looking at this, it turned out there were all these threes in there. It's also about China, India, and Pakistan, and there were other things that crept in. And so it turned out that, you know, the triangle really made a big impact in this book. But the interesting thing that came out of all this was that uh, the math did not help so much. I mean, I think at some subconscious level it does help, but um, you know, to, to say that, okay, this is, this is what, I'm pulling this out of my mathematical brain and using it in this, that's kind of hard to do. What are you working on now? So now what I'm working on is a, uh, it's a math, uh, it's, a, it's a novel actually, and this is the last thing I'm gonna show. Uh, it's, let's see, I have it here. Uh, it's a math novel, it's called the, 
I'll, the title will come up, but it's actually going to explain math for non-mathematicians, but it's also going to be a story. It's written like a murder mystery a little. Uh, so let's see if this shows it. That's the title. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> Should we take some questions? Yeah. We, we all like to put people in boxes, and there's a lot of talk about left brain, right brain people. And so I'd, I'd just like to ask you, do you feel you're in your left brain sometimes, in your right brain sometimes, or do you feel they're working together? Well, uh, from what I've read about this, you know, this is a, um, it's a fallacy that people use just one side of their brain. So everyone does use both sides and at the same time. Um, so I think, I think that, what I'm really trying to do, though, is to break down that barrier and use the more artistic types of things that I'm interested in, apply them to math, and vice versa. And I think we all have that in us. You know, there's, there's just, there's, there's always, as I said, we are all programmed to like order and pattern and symmetry. So there is that, those mathematical qualities that we all have. And we also have this need for art and music and so on. So, you know, why don't we combine that more? And it's just, I think it is a cultural thing. We're just told that we should just do one thing. Well, as a former math major and a little girl that had a poster of Renee Descartes on her bedroom wall, I just want to say those kind of questions just, like, put me so on edge because there, there is a false duality that to be good at something, you have to be bad at something. And that's just a false duality. For instance, one of the things I loved about abstract algebra is that every morning we went to lecture and the professor would say, okay, imagine a universe where these rules apply. You know, not necessarily the, math, the, the calculation, the addition and subtraction that you know. But imagine a different universe where the mathematics behaves according to these rules. And then we would then develop a whole universe right. in that hour and a half lecture and see some very surprising stories arise. And they're stories. Yes, and let me, let me actually, that's a perfect thing because there was something that we didn't actually get to. And this was uh, Vijay Sheshadri, who's here. He told Casey yesterday to ask me about the poem, uh, Euclid has, alone has looked on beauty bare. Euclid is the famous mathematician, the geometer. And um, this is something that we actually, turns out, used in our play. And the English professor is very much for poetry. And so she's saying this, Euclid alone has looked on beauty pair. And the mathematician immediately has a problem with it. And what he says is that there's a whole branch of geometry called non-Euclidean geometry which, as you said, is another way of looking at geometry where not all the assumptions made by Euclid hold. And that gives you a perfectly consistent, very beautiful geometry. And so his thing was, well, Euclid isn't the only one who's looked at beauty bear. So thank you for that. This one back there. Hi. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed 
Thank you. Everything you showed there. I just wondered if you thought that with how technical everything is getting, whether it's our iPhones or, you know, all the different uh, cars even that have computers and so much automation in them, if this isn't a perfect time for this kind of merging. And I wondered if you'd read the book, The Martian. I you haven't. Know, I heard, I've heard about it, but I haven't is, read it. Which is, again, very, very technical and incredibly popular, mm -hmm. or things like the TV series Numbers. Right. Which, yes, Numbers you know, I'm familiar with. Well, uh, the answer I would, I would say is that, first of all, the fact that we have all these iPhones and so on is not something that... Okay, here's, here's a question that was asked of uh, the New York Times. Uh, why they don't actually do more, uh, do more, this was many years ago, do more articles on math and something like, you know, explaining how an iPhone works. And the answer was that people aren't really interested in that. They just want to be able to use it. So if you start telling people, okay, this is how it works, it's not just going to, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. So this is a huge problem, like what does the natural, what is the natural or the most useful thing for the general population to know in terms of math? And are we teaching our kids the right thing? Not everyone is going to become a mathematician. So there's this whole area of numeracy, which includes something like statistics that are very helpful, like being able to judge things. Are these the right numbers? Are politicians just giving us complete junk? And be able to come to some conclusion that, hey, this, this is fishy. So to develop that kind of numerical sense is, I suspect, more useful than you know, being able to do a calculus problem, which could be left to those who are really interested in it. Yes, there's a question there. Okay. Hello? Okay. Yes. Hello. Uh, what I want to know is, so what you're saying is that the twain does meet word and number. I think right? so. I think so, it does. So numbers can explain words and words can explain numbers. Absolutely. And in fact, that's what my novel is about. Um, it's actually looking at the birth of everything through mathematics, starting with nothing and building up all the numbers and then using the numbers to build up everything else, but told in a fictional way. Uh, and of course, words have, words are essential for numbers, but numbers are also essential for everything else. I mean, imagine if we didn't have any numbers, uh, all the computer programs would break down, you know, we'd be having exploding nuclear reactors, God knows what else. So that's a good idea. Maybe I'll use that for the next novel. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's a question there. There's one. Hello, uh, Professor. So, I'm a graduate student here in the like in the engineering department, and I want to know in what like I, like what I'm interested in is to see how did you actually foray into literature and writing, because I think as as you go through your professional schooling, you normally go into just the math. You you study this. You don't actually put exactly. in time for right. the creative arts, and I'm not really sure whether you actually get that exposure also. And personally, I haven't got that exposure. Yeah. So I want to know in what way would you recommend or would say students um, within the engineering and the sciences domain could, could get um, exposed to the arts and the sciences in terms of creating art rather than just appreciating it in terms sure, of just sure. reading yes. and watching? Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, when I was a grad student, I actually took a class on film appreciation. and. You know, I had to get a special signature and they say, oh, you're being frivolous, huh? But then I got the permission. So that was an interesting thing. So I think you can take classes in, uh, that are not in your field. That's one way. Uh, like trying to, if you're interested in writing, which is what I was, I was just writing maybe one story every year. You know, just one story, like two or three pages. Something would come, I would write it. And then it just became something that I was more interested in. So I started joining a writing group. I started showing my work to other writers. And this was, you know, like several years worth. I mean, I started writing in 83 when I first became a professor. Uh, my first book was published in 2001. And I didn't have anything published. I tried that, that, you know, that, that just stay away from. I think you have to find something that really gives you uh, that inner satisfaction. And then you have to try and get good at it. That's what I did. And that was what was very satisfying. Just keep working at it, 
get the community if you can find other people. I used to actually go, you know, I was so paranoid about people in my department finding out. I used to actually go to Washington from Baltimore and go to a writing group there. It was like a James Bond existence. Hey, I'm doing this. So, so you know, something like that would be really good. Try writing something. Um, try to find people that might be also interested. We have time for one more question. One more question. Maybe Rebecca? Oops. Yes, I hope I can put this in a clear way. But I'm interested in, um, as a writer, thinking about structure. Mm -hmm. And um, in most of Western literature, we're dealing with the Euclidean model. I would say, sort of beginning, middle, and end, um, the peak at the third act, let's say, and then the resolution. But if you're looking at something like the Mahabharata, for instance, there's this sort of ongoing cyclical structure that's very different. Um, are, do you think about that as you're structuring your work? Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's not so much uh, trying to impose that but just realizing that coming from a different culture, like coming from India, you're naturally going to have this multi-perspective uh, uh, structure that, that you've grown up with. Right. So that it's not always a single focus, you know, painting with a single vanishing point. Right. There are gonna be different things happening all around. Um, one of the best uh, examples of that is, uh, who is that famous photographer, the Indian photographers? Uh, who was it? One yes, minute. yes. Uh, uh, his, his work, if you look at it, it's amazing. There's something going on there, there's something going on here, there's all these different things happening, and your eye is constantly taken to other places. And that is something that I feel, you know, if someone were to do an analysis of Indian authors, including myself, you would see more of that. Right. You know, we are, we are still necessarily, you know, confined by the need to have a narrative, but there are more tendencies, perhaps, to, to have this multi-structure kind of, you know, like India. If you're trying to describe India, you need this, this and, big... And do you feel like that's a, a, there's a mathematical um, sort of counterpoint that's, that's under the infrastructure of that? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the cliché thing to, would be to talk about chaos here. Uh -huh, that, right. you know, the, the difference between chaos and order. Right, But rational. yeah, there's all sorts of mathematics that would describe these multi-pronged kinds of ideas. So mathematicians can really analyze just about anything and can come up with a mathematical structure or framework that it would fit in. Right. Oh, I think we're out of time. Thank you.